Hello, everyone. Welcome. Happy New Year by one month later, only because we want to invite you and welcome you to our first 2023 Mosaic Arts Online live event. I am so happy to be back here at uh, what we hope will be more regular events. We really are excited to invite our instructors back to this platform and have them share what they've been creating, what they've been working on, traveling. A lot more people are getting out there now and being able to teach. And we are so excited to hear about everybody and everything that's going on in the world. So stay tuned as this schedule will start to fill up and we'll probably mm -hmm. be back here hopefully about once a month to share more about what's going on in our instructors' lives and back here at Mosaic Arts Online. So thank you for being here. And as we get started, I wanna just say that it's really about engagement for us and our community. That is what we want to build. As we all know, you're working alone in your studios, you're learning on your own. And we know Mosaic Arts Online can really um, help your process along and further your skills with our instructors and the courses that we are creating and have on our platform. But if we don't have our community, we don't feel like we have anything. So this is a huge part of Mosaic Arts Online. And the fact that our instructors are willing to come on with us and share what they're doing or share how they can provide more information like today, Will, with Rachel in our Ask Rachel Anything uh, event. So first of all, I want to thank Rachel for being here. I want to thank all of you for being here and starting this new year off right. We have just returned from Mexico and my Todos Santos Mosaic Art Retreats. So this is really the beginning of the new year for us so that we can get started with these monthly, hopefully, events. So with that, I would just like to say a little bit about Rachel before we start asking her some questions. As long as I've known Rachel, which has been almost 10 years now, Rachel has always been an evolving creator. When I first met her, she was an up and coming artist and um, instructor. People were killing themselves to get into her workshops in SAMA and at different studios. And things changed over time and Rachel realized other things that were important to her, like the fact that she had bought a home that had an abandoned coal mine on it. And all she saw was concrete walls that could become the canvases and the substrates for incredible mosaics and the community she built there, which is called the Ruins Project, which we will get into in a little bit and discuss uh, and answer some of the questions that people have asked about it. <clears throat> and now, the ever evolving Rachel Sager has moved into a whole new focused area of her life and that is writing and a podcast. And if you are not familiar with that, Rachel's definitely going to talk a little bit more about Substack and the platform that she's doing these two new things in. So without further ado, my good friend and fellow Mosaic Art instructor and producing courses here at Mosaic Arts Online, Rachel Sager. Thank you, Tammy. What a what an introduction. <laughs> I always love these events, really. I'm thrilled to be here. So yes. Um, <clears throat> so the way that today is designed is that we have actually asked for questions and some of you have sent them in. And that means you were a student or are a student of Rachel from Mosaic Arts Online. And after the, about the 30 minute range, or we'll see how far it kind of goes, we're open to questions from anybody. And that can be written in the chat section. And my producer, Jerry, will pop those over to me and we will ask Rachel those. So Rachel is aware of these first questions because we've gone over them and discussed them as she, they were sent in. So those are what we're going to really work on and kind of get into right now. And then we'll talk about uh, opening it up to other questions at our chat. So, but before anything else, can I please have you say hello and where you're from in our chat? We love to know where people are coming from and who's joining us. So again, thank you for being here. And Rachel, do you have anything to say before we get started? Uh, well, it would, would be, um, very cool for me to just um, kind of introduce everyone. I know a lot of you probably already are reading my sub stacks because I talk about them pretty much every day. I post them every day. And for all of you who have been following, I just say a very heartfelt thank you. It means really truly means the world to me that you are subscribing, whether you're free or paid either way. 
I am trying to make a living at writing and it's a very interesting emotional time um, <clears throat> for me. Uh, and I, you know, I, I it's kind of like therapy, my writing. Um, I'm working out my problems. That's how I end every post that I make on Substack is thank you for being here as I work out my problems on the page. And that's really, really what it is. Um, and, and you're here for it. So it's, it's kind of like a live therapy session. And sometimes hopefully you're benefiting from my ideas too. And they're always circling around mosaic and also the ruins, you know, everything in, you know, in my life circles around that. So almost every post has something about the medium or the ruins and also life. And that's what we're all here for. We're all here to engage and feel a little bit more of a sense of connection. And what better way than to start this off with Rachel, who's doing exactly that. She wants to connect with her community and do it through her writing now. And I love it. I just listened to one of her podcasts this morning, her latest one. Her voice, her way of sharing her information is absolutely beautiful. So I think it's wonderful that you have created this new medium to uh, express yourself. And like I said, you are the ever evolving artist. So this is a fantastic way to uh, share it. Thanks, Tammy. Thanks. Should we dive into a question? Give me, give me a question. All right. <laughs> no. So I'm going to have to look down at my paper a little bit, but um, will there be a virtual ruins tour this year with Mosaic Arts? Yes, we have committed to annual tours. Uh, I think it'll be in August. We haven't set the date yet, but um, every, how many have we done now, Tammy? I, I can't, I don't know, three or four, this before maybe? Uh, I don't know. Um, I really, um, I'm already thinking about it now that it's, you know, kind of become an annual thing. Uh, my One of my jobs is to set a tone for each tour and every tour has a different kind of a feeling to it. You know, that's in addition to all the new art, of which there will be a lot of new art for 2023. There are things happening behind the scenes right now um, that I can't really unveil yet, but um, some very cool, oh, some ambitious sculptures, more portraits, countries, um, and again, things I can't talk about yet, but uh, so it'll be a great tour. Absolutely. So uh, if you are new to hearing the words, the ruins project, which is very possible, Rachel lives in Witsit, Pennsylvania, and she offers live tours of the property. And you can always find it if you Google the ruins project in also with Sager Mosaics. So if you're unfamiliar, that's a good way to introduce yourself. If you live in the area of Eastern, Western Pennsylvania, then you can get yourself there and have a physical tour, especially as things will be warming up in the next couple of months and the snow starts to melt. So let's move on to our next question. Can you share some of your process of how you come up with a new online course? Hmm. Um, well, I do one a year. Um, sometimes I, I film two when I come to um, to Tammy to film, but usually I, I've, I've, I've kind of found that middle ground that one actually makes more sense. So I spend a whole year thinking, thinking, thinking about a new, a different way to fall in love with mosaic um, because all of my all of my teaching is is revolving around the idea of truly falling in love with the medium uh, whether it's foraging or fire <laughs> or um, composition or that quilt right behind your shoulder Sammy um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm always rolling around an idea and it's usually only stays an idea um, in the first maybe half of the year. And then I start to zo zoom in on things. Right now I'm two weeks away from getting on a plane and traveling to Tammy to film my next one. So I'm pretty far along in the planning process. I'm very excited about this one, but I say that every year. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I make an outline, I, I edit, 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 and then I get in front of the camera and it's, it's really, um, a magical thing that I just really respond to teaching in the Mosaic Arts Online format with the hands, uh, you know, on camera, but just listening to my voice and the planned outness of the whole thing. I just made up a word, planned outness, but um, I love I love teaching. I loved past tense teaching live. Um, 
but I just couldn't keep it up. I, th I think we may talk about that a little bit later. Um, I just, I love, I love the format of being organized and breaking it into chapters and a lot, a lot of it's planned before I get there, but a lot of it actually happens uh, extemporaneously right on camera too, which, you know, you've seen that happen. So it's a fun, uh, it's a creative process, uh, doing a class. Absolutely. It's a creative process in itself. So it is. And coming here to our headquarters, which is in Santa Barbara, California, um, I think also opens things up to different ideas and a way to collaborate. And um, it's a very creative space here. We have half of um, our property dedicated to the studios that we have here. So there's lots of um, opportunity and different things that Rachel can sort of dive into, look one way and find something and look another way and find something. So each course does have a personality that is developed by being, I think, here at the studio as well. And I feel very proud of that because it's an amazing collaboration between us. And something else that lives here at uh, MAO uh, headquarters are these little things called chickens. And these are pets that um, one thing Rachel and I share in common is we have pet chickens and how we take care of them and how much they mean to us and how backyard chicken is one word to us. So uh, we won't get too much into that now because we could really go down a two hour rabbit hole on that one, but we won't. Mm -hmm. And someone asked a really cute question or just said something really sweet. So I'm just going to throw it out there. And it says, if you take care of chickens, does that make you a chicken tender? <laughs> Well, do uh, I have to answer that? that so I guess yeah, that means that I am a chicken tender. <laughs> so that's very cute. Okay, so back to the creative process. Being a creative person, how do you hand over the creative power to the artists that come into your space? Oh, this is to me. Is this to you? It's in my mind. It's like having people. Oh, no, this is that one. It's cut my. It's in my mind. It's like having people come into your house and hang their work on the wall. I'm going to ask that again, because this is actually directed to Rachel when people come into her space at her studio during the tours, right? No, I think it meant, I think it's about inviting people to put their art on the walls of the ruins. I think oh, that's what okay. So let me ask it again. That's my fault. Okay. Being a creative okay. person yourself, how do you hand over your creative power to the artists that come and hang in, hang, come into your space? In my mind, it's like having people come into your house and hang their work on your wall. Yeah, yeah I get it. I get what she's saying. Yeah. Um, it's funny. Uh, <clears throat> I kind of know how to answer this, but at the same time, um, I'm not sure. It makes me think immediately of uh, the guy, um, uh, the, the, the founded Picassiette, Raymond Isidore, I think the French, the French guy who who mosaiced um, his house, the inside of his house, the outside of his house, his chairs, his bed, every single surface around his whole life, he mosaiced um, outside of Paris. And it's become a museum. It's a really cool place to visit. Uh, but he did that as a complete and utter solo project, I think. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that was a solo lifetime project. And I could have done that to the ruins. You know, I, I own it. It's mine. I could easily have gone that route, but it just never occurred to me to do, do it that way. I have been, um, from the very first time that I, I got in front of the medium and got to a SAMA conference probably and realized there was this whole world of, of people who were doing the same thing that I love to do is I wanted to be a champion for the medium itself. I, I just have always, that's always been a part of, of, of the energy inside of me. And so it just made sense to bring people to the walls of the ruins and give them a giant bear hug. That's one of the things we say on the tour is that the ruins is a giant bear hug to the mosaic community. Um, so it was just never an option to keep it to myself. Uh, it just comes naturally. So it's not like I had to try to do it. It's just the way it is. That's awesome. And I, I totally get it that way. Um, someone's asking, why have you stopped teaching in-person workshops and how has your work practice changed over the years and what has influenced that change from Linda? Okay. I'll answer the first one first. Um, I stopped because, um, I, I was, it's been maybe four or five years since I stopped teaching live, um, at a breakneck speed, uh, 
I have to focus on most important things. And the older I get as an artist, the more important that those most important things are becoming. And I'm much more able to identify them and say no and say yes at the right times. Uh, I, I, I really do like to say both of those things, but I have to say them in the right ways <clears throat> or else I get exhausted. Um, I'm, a, I'm a hibernator even though I enjoy getting out and talking to groups of people and, you know, even being on stage sometimes I enjoy sharing very personal things about myself in my writing. Even I am absolutely an introvert. Um, Robert always says, no, you're not, you know, but mm -hmm. I, I am. Uh, and if I don't get my little hibernation time, <clears throat> uh, I, I just start to break down. So the live teaching was taking a lot out of me. Um, and, and, you know, also paired with, living a very public life here because we have the business we have people coming in all the time i mean not so much in the winter but on the trail and for the tours i i just have to ha be able to have my downtime and mosaic arts online was like it just saved it saved my life in some ways it really did it, it enabled me to keep teaching because i love to teach i love to share ideas and help people embrace um different parts of mosaic and and that the the online courses give me that so I guess I feel like I'm getting the best of both. Um, so that was the first part. What was the second part of that question? How has your work practice changed over the years and what has influenced that change? Um, hmm. I think whatever seems to be happening around me. I mean, the other people that, uh, the collaborations that happen in the ruins have, have a huge impression or a huge, you know, effect on me. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not a solitary <clears throat> artist just in my own studio without other things coming at me all the time. Uh, I learn things from the ruins artists themselves like they, you know, they say it when you're a teacher, you have to be a student too. And that's so completely true. Right. Um, you know, like Sophie Druin introduced me to, the uh, torch with the Mel Moscato and uh, never been the same. You know, we had one little afternoon of her showing me how to do that. And uh, it changed that, that changed, you know, the game completely in some ways. I still work with stone, but uh, you know, hot glass has become uh, one of my go-tos, you know, especially for the jewelry. And I think maybe that's another uh, thing that has really uh, evolved over the years is that I've been more focused on making jewelry um, and I'm starting to, actually do some metal work, which I'm really excited about. I took a, took a class, um, became a student uh, for some metal working at Touchstone, which is right down the down the road from here, and um, invested in some some jewelry infrastructure for the studio. So things have been changed around a good bit. Um, yeah, I think that answers that question. I'm sure I could talk about it more, but you know. And I think it's amazing that Sophie taught you and how many people you've been able to teach that to because of Mosaic Arts Online. You could never have reached mm -hmm. physically yeah. the amount of people that now get so excited about hot glass and about pulling and about having successful mixes and the different things that can be created with it. So it, it, that just shows you the spark that can come from one idea and how many Rachel does have that an annual trip out here to teach is kind of a no-brainer. And on mm -hmm. that note, your next question <laughs> is, how do you continue to create new ideas for your online courses? But maybe you've sort of answered that unless you want to highlight anything. I think I have. I, well, well, there, there's a little bit more of a wrinkle to that one possibly. And I do think the ruins teaches me. Uh, so we had that big project last year, which was the patch house project, which was the three quilts. Uh, and, and that was a real a small group collaboration, myself, Deb Engelbaugh and Linda Rosenblum working very, very um, intensely together for a, a good year before we even unveiled it. Um, so I fell in love with the art of quilts without ever having made a, an actual quilt. I call myself a fake quilt quilter. Uh, but that piece behind you, Tammy, the one that I that I taught the uh, quilt blocking Picassiette. Uh, is a direct result of that ruins project because I fell in love with a new idea and I figured out a way to turn it into a course that was very beginner friendly. I'm really proud of that one as far as being beginner friendly. The Vens were also, um, <clears throat> I can't talk about that one too much because that's another un not 
not unveiling ruins project. Uh, but yeah, the Vens were, were another thing that grew out of a bigger idea. Um, the intuitive on Demento, of course, you know, that that's just wrapped up in everything in the ruins. So I, I think maybe the way I answer that question is the ruins teaches me, uh, and it's, you know, I give it anthropomorphic, uh, you know, a quality to it. And, and I think it does that for everybody. It's so big. Um, there's so much going on in it that people visit and especially people who are tapped into mosaic and really care about it and see the world in pieces of things, the ideas they get from walking through or the virtual tour, <clears throat> um, give them all kinds of new ideas of new creative processes. Mm -hmm. It's it, yeah. And I, I just trust every time you call me and say, okay, I have my idea. It's a very short conversation about what it's going to be, how it's going to be. And I have my input and immediately the two of us have collaborated on it and you're off running to get it ready mm -hmm. to bring mm -hmm. here and we will uh, produce it. So it's, you know, it's just great to have this kind of partnership that I know is reaching so many people because it's, it's really beautiful. So our next question, and I don't know how you wanna answer this because you sort of got there, but are there any behind the scenes ruins projects that you can share that have not been announced yet? Hmm. <clears throat> Let's see, I wanna get myself in trouble. I wanna <laughs> get in trouble. I think it's probably okay. I think it's okay to say that there are a pair of boots, uh, a sculptural pair of boots, um, uh, very, um, you know, coal miner uh, kind of boots being made by Helga Maribel Sanchez, um, who is the, the artist of the Turkey. So you can imagine, you know, it's high quality boots. <laughs> um, and they'll become, the boots will become a part of the story and a part of, of you know, as your experience as you're walking through the ruins. So we're pretty excited about those. Um, we also have, um, I think it's like also okay to say we have an eagle uh, coming that is part of the Feather Project, uh, very important, ambitious uh, sculptural piece also um, by Barb Goff. And uh, let's see what else, <clears throat> what else can I talk about? There's several portraits. Uh, there's a portrait, um, Oh, swiftly swirling. I'm trying to think of Adelaide Arash. Um, I hope I got that right because uh, I don't have any notes right now, but she made a beautiful uh, portrait of a real man, um, Charles Paul, Charlie Paul Verba, uh, who was a coal miner in Banning 2 coal mine here, right in this coal mine, who died when he was 19 in the coal mine. Uh, so it's such a tragic story. And she is all the way from Russia. She's a Russian artist and um, she... Uh, it, it's quite a story, actually. It's really crazy. Uh, shipping it here seemed a little difficult just because of the world right now. Uh, so she was physically going to Argentina um, with the, is it the Giulio Manassi um, symposium. that have a symposium down in Argentina? So I knew that. Uh, so I asked her to carry the portrait with her to Argentina, knowing that there would be at least one American uh, there. And it turns out Annabella, we were uh, brought it back and it's now in Miami. So it went from Russia to Argentina to Miami and eventually to Witsit. Uh, and it's just a beautiful classically done um, uh, portrait of, of his beautiful, handsome face. Heartbreaking really. And that will hopefully be here in the spring for installation. Um, and the more portraits, some countries, Israel just arrived. Edna Segev <clears throat> from Israel, um, built Israel. Um, it, it arrived safely, but I haven't even opened it yet. It'll be, it'll be in, um, unveiled, you know, as soon as the weather gets nice. So those are, there's some little ones. Uh, that's all I can say right now. Well, that, that's, I think you're going to keep you pretty busy, especially if those are just a few. So on that <laughs> note, you did mention in our tour last summer that you said you were nearing the end of adding to the ruins and that you wanted to leave it unfinished. Yeah, I'm full of shit. Too. I'm full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> I am totally, I really am. I, I've made my peace with the fact that that is completely not true. Uh, I, I think l last year I was still uh, reeling, you know, with big changes in my family, I, you know, losing my father and uh, just a lot of tumultuous, tumultuous, energy <laughs> and i i just couldn't see enough far enough in the future i think um 
having Erica Blue Green Chair on Instagram, the Ruins, aka the Ruins Fairy, here um, has helped. I, I know I've mentioned this before, but her um, her apprenticeship assistantship has helped me, um, you know, with so many things, and I, and I'm able to see. <clears throat> that it may never be done actually, uh, really. And, and one of the things that is going to be unveiled in March, I cannot talk about it quite yet, but it's as big as anything that's happened here. It's very different. Um, and it's big enough for everybody. I, I think I can say almost everybody it's big, uh, is going to enable, um, the projects just to keep going into the future. As long as I can do it, you know, I, I don't know how long I'm going to, you know, myself be able to keep the ruins going, but, uh, yeah, so it's definitely not done. <laughs> well, I love that. And I think we all can say that 2023 has kind of infused some really positive energy into life. And so to say how you felt honestly in the summer is totally fair. And like I said, in the very beginning of this event, it's evolving. You are evolving. Everything's evolving. So there doesn't need to be any hard stamps put on anything. So if you say this summer again, it's over, we'll listen. <laughs> but we'll listen. Right, right. And, um, uh, so it says, what is your master plan placement of mosaics at the ruins? What caused your initial passion to work in mosaic? Okay, those are two very different questions. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the first one, how do I place the art? Uh, I'm getting much better at that. You know, now it's, it, it, this will be year eight. And I've, I've really, um, I talk to the ruins, the ruins talks to me. I talk to other people about, you know, lines of sight is something that I think a lot about composition. Uh, you know, I consider the entire space to be its own big composition. So every single thing we add changes everything else, um, which you think could, you know, that could paralyze someone from making decisions, but it doesn't seem to do that to me. I'm pretty good at, at just rolling with things. And when it feels right, you know, there's an intuitive, um, uh, I let, I let my intuition talk to me and, uh, you know, yeah, I taught that, taught that workshop with you, Tammy, um, intuitive composition and, uh, so many of the elements in that workshop actually play out in the ruins, you know, about focal points and pattern and, uh, negative space and all those things come into play as we're deciding because um, let's just say like the train as an example, Steve-O's train, you know, is the biggest mosaic in the ruins. It takes up that whole giant wall, right? Fills up the whole space. I was able to install tiny, tiny, tiny little mosaic birds onto that train and I did not know that was going to happen. It just kind of, you know, the bird arrived, the little sparrow, I think, were the, were the two that I'm talking about right now. And I think they might have been the smallest birds of the feather project. And I got so much enjoyment and still do out of seeing the smallest bird on the biggest mosaic. And it's just like it's taking a ride on the train. Uh, so that's uh, using um, uh, like juxtaposition of size is something that that I think about when I'm making an installation uh, and, and people's experience is always, <clears throat> always number one in when I'm making a decision, because as you walk through the space, um, I never want it to become an amusement park. I've said that several times. I don't want it to be, Oh, look at this. Oh, there's like all on top of each other. I, I, I want your eye to be able to rest as you move through and I want the negative space to stay an important element. Um, and luckily, there are so many hidden nicks and nooks and crannies in the ruins that uh, you know I can hide things. Uh, I was just talking to some some girls yesterday about a possible future um, collaboration installation about uh, um, putting some really fun uh, compositions in hidden places that no one really necessarily sees unless they know they're there or they, you know, are exploring. Uh, so <clears throat> yeah, I, I, it feels like a game it, to me, uh, uh, choosing the places. And, now, you know, I, I've also said that it becomes harder and harder every year to choose the places because it becomes more important because each one affects another. And, uh, you know, you don't want, sometimes you want complimentary, but sometimes you want 
you know, two really different things right next to each other. And that can work too. Sometimes it just depends. Um, like sometimes, like as an example, the portrait room uh, is going to be filled with portraits by all different artists and every portrait will be a different style because every portrait artist, you know, some are traditional, some are hyper um, modern, like Gila Rayberg's piece is so unique and clearly Gila, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there, so each one will be, it, I don't want to say a caco cacophony of voices, but kind I mean, yeah, kind of. Um, uh, and the gears, you know, that's a whole different thing. The gears just always work. No matter where you put a gear, it always seems to work next to another gear. I don't know what that's about, but um, placement is fun. And that has to be interesting too, because when you place it, that's it. It's in. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty so cool. So yeah. it's not something where you can start moving things around like interior design in your living room, you know? Right, it's right. Forever. So composition has got to be, again, the word we keep using today, evolving and mm -hmm. changing and figuring out how the next best space is going to be used whether it's got the train in it or it's a blank wall and whatever's coming in March with this big, new, exciting um, project that you're going to add. So that second question is what caused your initial passion to work in mosaic art? Mm, well, that was just luck. Um, I answered an ad in the paper back in the nineties when I was still in my twenties to work in a little, um, little tiny mosaic studio outside of New York city out in the country. And I got hired as the grouter, just the grouter, nothing else. I was not allowed to touch the mosaic. I was not allowed to have the nippers uh, for like a year, a year and a half. They just kept me in the grouting room. It was the dirty job, you know? Um, but I loved it. I, I totally, I loved it. I fell in love with it right there. Um, and I think I was even introduced to is Raymond Isidore when I was working there. I think there was a book about his Bikes yet. Um, and and uh, yeah, it, it just, I never stopped. It started with mirrors, broken plates, tabletops, furniture. And, um, and that was right before the internet really started to become a way for learning or finding things. So, yeah. Yes. We all have our beginner mm -hmm. stories and mm -hmm. they're, they're very important to us because they are the foundation of how it all started. <clears throat> so this question comes from Lynn and she is asking, how do you manage your time between your myriad of passions? I'm assuming she, she still carves out time to make mal mischiato and create mosaic art. But all the things that compromise comprise her life and the ruins. Wow. And it's mal mischiato because I always say it wrong. It's mischiato, mm -hmm. not mish. Mish, misch, mischiato, is it? Yeah. Well, then I've, I've been pronouncing it. I always think of mixing, you know, mish, 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 mischiato. Okay, mal mischiato. There's um, there. um, time. Well, I, I just as a, a one little example, uh, Robert has, he's my other half, my wonderful other half who holds so much together, has, uh, I hate to say this, but I think he's a better Mal Mischiato puller than I am. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he is taking it to another level. Um, he's pulling 17 feet long threads of glass on the porch. Um, and I'd be doing a video of that. As soon as the weather gets nice, I'm going to video him again. And I don't know what it is, but he just has that touch and 17 feet. I mean, it's ridiculous. He puts it in a, um, a vice. So he doesn't have to do this with both hands. So he has, you know, he just moves his body away from the vice, which is holding the screwdriver of, of the main ball of glass. So that's been great. Um, as much as I kind of miss pulling it, I'm sure I'll do it once in a while, but it helps me uh, make more jewelry, certainly, and more rust belts. You know, those are one of the things that fly out of the studio pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> I guess I, another way to answer that question is that I don't think I do anything I don't want to do anymore. Um, I say no to more things than that I would necessarily feel comfortable in order to say yes to the ones that really need to be said yes to. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's it really. I mean, that sounds really simple, but I just say no to things I don't want to do. I don't do commissions anymore. I'm not a commission artist. I never have been. I've done commissions and I'm not good at them. Um, I just don't thrive when I have roles set or someone's telling me to do something a certain way. 
it just doesn't work out well for me or them. <laughs> so that's been a relief. Uh, taking the commissions off the table has given me more time to do things. That, the thing is I exactly want to do following the energy. And yep. something I'm reading about lately is just going where I'm most excited. That just seems to give me more time. Yeah, no, that mm -hmm. you and I could talk that talk for a long time. And I totally agree with it. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is, what are the frames of your house mosaic series made of? And are they available for purchase? The houses. So I have a, 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 there's several different uh, <clears throat> uh, frames that I have created. And one of them was the houses. Uh, they are 3D printed and they are made of plastic, um, hard plastic. Um, and I don't know if I have, I think if you come into the studio, I might sell you a house or two. I don't have a lot in stock. The Vens, uh, the three circle and the two circle Vens are something that we actively sell on the website. And I see those black circles in the background. Um, and those are part of, of the intuitive Ven course. Uh, the houses, I, uh, there's so much a part of the ruins for the, for the quilts that I've been a little pr protective of the images. So I may, um, may design some different houses for sale. I haven't quite decided on that yet. That's a possibility, but right now I think I would just sell you one if you came in and, and, and asked. So yeah, All right. well, that might be a long trip for somebody, but we'll see. Yeah. So mm -hmm. in the same vein of the patch quilt houses and the house. Someone's asking, are you concerned about some of the broken dishes that were used in those mosaics and will they be suitable for the freeze thaw or do <clears throat> you care if they last long or is it just part of the ever evolving living environment? Do you take precautions to ensure they may last? Great question. Um, we do embrace everything about the ruins embraces the idea of time, the philosophy of time, um, you know, it is a ruins. Uh, the ruins is a ruins. And uh, we do best practices. Absolutely. Um, when we were building the quilts, we had a series of what was called the quilting bees, you know, just like a quilting bee with women coming around the circle. We had them online on Zooms and we used those to talk in depth about uh, what materials to use successfully. So we talked about high fired versus low fired uh, plates and, and how to maybe look for those. But we did leave the choices up to the artists. They made their own choices uh, knowing that. <clears throat> um, and let's see, what's the other thing? Oh, we there's a wonderful product that I've been, I've talked about for years. I'm a big Laticrete fan. Uh, that's what we use exclusively as our adhesives in the ruins. But there's this really cool sealer called Laticrete um, 310 sealer. So it's a stone sealer technically, but it can be used for ceramic and uh, other things too. And it makes things, it, it creates a water barrier, but it doesn't have any um, uh, shininess. It's completely matte. It looks like once it dries, it doesn't look like anything has happened. So we've been using that all over the ruins for years. Um, and we painted the entire Picassiette quilt with that. So all of those edges of the broken plates that don't have glaze on them are now sealed on all sides with that with that sealer with a little tiny paintbrush. Erica did the whole thing with the paintbrush in the fall and we will most likely do it again next year. We've done that with a lot of the clay work, um, you know, the handmade clay that we use, the hand stamp things um, to great success. I have Picassiette in the ruins that's eight years old and there's nothing, uh, you know, there, there's nothing. I have one piece, there's one uh, Mexicans, um, tile. I know it was Mexican tile because I walked on it my entire childhood. My, my bathroom, my parents tiled the bathroom with Mexican tile and it chips. It does. It, it, it flakes off in, in hot, you know, in bad winters. Uh, but it is, it, I mean, we live in Western Pennsylvania. We're not working in, you know, this is not Rome or any, you know, it's not, um, it, it's a, it's an intense environment. And <clears throat> I love watching the moss grow on things and the lichen grow on not everything, but certain things. Uh, I think that's a part of the beauty of the ruins. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not pristine. It's definitely a living, breathing environment. And that's a huge part of it. So this is our next question and I'll read the whole comment because I just think it's beautiful. And it says, wow. So thankful for these events to inspire those of us quote in training, 
Rachel, when I first saw the Ruins tour, I was just blown away by the idea, the creativity and collaboration community contributions. So down to earth, so grounding. It was so moving. I imagined hearing beautiful music, leaning on the classical side, but Ibram Malouf, I might've messed that up, would also be a beautiful fit. My question is, do you listen to music while you create? And if so, who inspires you? Thank you. I love your teaching style. You have a gift of taking the fear out of the technique and that's what I needed. Rita. Wow. Very nice. I love that question. Uh, yeah, I, I love classical too. And I, it fits in the ruins. Absolutely. But I am a creature of habit. Uh, I drive Robert crazy actually, cause I listen to the same station all the time <laughs> and I, I never get tired of it. Um, I do Americana, blue, uh, some of the new bluegrass kind of, I mean, I like old bluegrass too, but old crow medicine show is one of my absolute favorites. Um, Oh, there's another one. I can't think of it right now. Oh, geez. You always introduce me to good music when you come. <clears throat> so, Bob yes. Dylan, yep. CCR, you know, I love all the old, the old classics, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the old school country. I love that. Uh, I definitely have a flavor, um, yes. you know, a little bit of a hillbilly going on there. So. <laughs> So it's 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 wrapping up on the questions that were uh, brought to us ahead of time. And we have a couple that have been sent in on the chat. But if you do have questions you'd like to ask Rachel now, now's a good time to pop him in the chat. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we would love to know is how did you find out about our live event? Just so we know how better to reach more of our community. If you don't mind putting in the chat, I heard about this and tell us where you heard about from social media. And we would love to know if it was Facebook or Instagram, please. I just ask that of you so that we can only get better at what we're doing. So with that said, let's pop into our next question here, which is in your opinion, what is the most important thing in making a living as an artist? I love that question. Mm. The most important thing. That's very limiting because there are so <laughs> many important things uh, at making a living. It's a, it's a uh, very chaotic, sometimes very chaotic, wonderful, wonderful way to live. I love what I do. Love it. But I would, let me think about this for a second. Um, it's, you know, it's funny. I, I just posted a um, on Substack this morning because I did every Wednesday and every Saturday I post for, for my writing. And today's was a read aloud. <clears throat> so sometimes I will uh, talk the post instead of necessarily writing it. I mean, I write it, but then I, I have a voiceover. And that's what this morning was. And it's called a mission statement um, for Mosaic. So I think maybe that's the answer uh, to making a living is having a vision slash mission statement um, embedded into your consciousness uh, while, because the life, the world's going to throw all kinds of crap at you as you're trying to, to do this, to make a living at making art. And if you're not focused and if you don't have the eye on, on something there that you're trying to get to, you're going to get distracted um, chasing the dollar. Um, and you have to, so, I mean, my vision is, is to is the better is to make the the ruins the best that i can make it um you know i, I i'm sure i can make that sound a little bit more eloquent um but i i feel like yeah that's that's really my answer is is having a vision or a mission statement um to make a living at at doing because there's always you're always walking a tightrope between trying to stay true to your creative self and and making a living and sometimes you know they go like this a little bit you know sometimes you get a little too excited about making a living and sometimes you get a little too excited about the the creative part and one or the other suffers so it's it's a tightrope for sure so keeping your eye on on the vision yeah i could talk for hours on that about how um you know, you, there's a difference between making a living at what you love to do and having a job. And I have never said I have a job. And um, it's just following your passion. And uh, one day, all of a sudden, it just starts to evolve into something that you either pay attention to and you give more to it or you don't. And um, more questions? Here we are. Sorry, we uh, had a quick little crash, but we're back. And um, so anyway, we were just talking about making a living as an artist and it crashed on us. So we're going to try <clears throat> jump onto another subject. 
it. Uh, so this is our last question that um, comes to us from the uh, pre-asked questions, and that is if you've ever done mosaic, if you have never done mosaic before, is there a course you recommend to get started without feeling too intimidated? That's from Billy. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, well, you know, my very first course is still, I believe my most popular, which is the intuitive on Demento, which, um, takes you all the way back to basics, 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 just, just how to cut and how to look at Tessera and, and break it down into very, very simple exercise, very simple exercises. Uh, it's a great beginner, beginner one. Um, the Picassiette, um, quilt blocking is also a great one. Uh, easy, easy as, as far as uh, obtaining the materials, you know, because they're almost all recycled and um, also bite-sized pieces very slowly building on the bite-sized pieces. And then the one that I'm going to be teaching in a couple of weeks is going to be absolutely very beginner friendly. So those would be my first three, I would say. Mm -hmm. and, and Tammy, and I just sent, oh, I just sent you the, another the, question. Okay. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So now that we've covered all of our questions that came to us throughout the last week, we have a few that have come in and I'm going to just pop right on to those since we're at about 15 minutes left for this event. So did owning an outdoor museum or an art installation become a dream or a goal for your future? When did it? Well, I'm not sure I understand that. Did it become? Um, was it when? Is that the question? When does it become owning an outdoor museum or an art installation become a dream or a goal for your future? I don't know. Maybe it's both. I think maybe it's both. Um, because a dream point? at, at so, what point? At what point? Well, I mean, I, I, you know, I start talking about buying the coal mine by accident because that's really what happened. You know, eight years ago when I bought my little house that I, that I live in, which is the office for the coal mine, I did not know that this all was over across the Creek. I was truly just buying a house to live in knowing that it was on a bike trail. So I was ambitious that way, thinking that I could make art on a bike trail and that that would be a positive thing, but understanding what, what the whole thing was completely, totally surprised. And, uh, it has just very slowly grown with every year. Um, and now it is uh, a dream and a goal. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yes. And that was from Helga. And Helga has one other question. How do you define the word intuitive? How can this word help an artist in her creative process? Oh, and what environment do you think is necessary to create intuitively? So I don't know if you want to answer those three separately or. So how to define intuitive? How to define the word intuitive. Mm -hmm. uh, well, intuition is, is actually defined by being not being able to be defined. Uh, that's kind of part of its definition is because it's, it's a feeling inside of you. Uh, like instinct, very much like instinct. Um, maybe instinct is more with an animal and intuition is more with the person possibly. Uh, but I mean, we all have it. Every single one of us has it. Some of us have learned to listen to it uh, more carefully than others. Sometimes we ignore it uh, to our detriment. Uh, I think if you start to pay attention to intuition, which can just be a feeling of being uncomfortable you know, in a certain situation, maybe if someone is invading your space in the wrong kind of way and you can't put words to it, you can't explain it, it doesn't even make sense, but you feel it. That's intuition. And uh, that's a negative way of talking about it. But when I'm talking about the intuition as in the creative process, um, maybe it's something that wakes you up in the middle of the night um, <clears throat> and you can't, you know, it just comes to you. Uh, so maybe it comes from uh, you know, up here somehow, which is an idea that I'm really excited about exploring. I'm reading this new book that I can't wait to talk about um, by Rick Rubin. But because uh, I, hmm, I'm trying to think if there's anything new that I want to say about intuition. Uh, I mean, intuitive on Demento is is the act of you know choosing the tessera and setting the tessera, cutting, choosing, setting over and over and over that repetitive process without overthinking it, without trying to 
you know, uh, judge too much or, 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 or um, second guess yourself, just do it, you know, just do it and do it and do it and do it until you get better at it. Uh, that's a big part of, of the intuitive everything because I teach several intuitive classes. So it, in, I think it's about trusting yourself. That, I think that's what intuition is, learning to trust yourself and being okay with making, being okay with possibly making a mistake and just moving forward anyway. Does that yeah. make sense, Tim? Yeah, no, that makes amazing sense. And you know me and intuition, I could go on for hours about mm -hmm. my daily practice of meditating and how it's really about getting out of your head. And once you get out of your head and thoughts, then all of a sudden you're more centered and grounded. And that's when intuition will just speak to you. And it is a daily practice. It is a rep repetition. And so mm -hmm. the rep repetition of making the art is the same idea. You don't have to sit on a pillow and meditate or go up on a mountain. It's just a repetition of doing something regularly. And it's and right there for everybody. Not, and whether you think you're a creative person or not, you can tap into your intuition. Yes. Uh, but, but the second part of the question was how how can this word help help you tap into the creative process? And I, I think a big part of, of the creative process is just the repetition, whether mm -hmm. you know what you're doing or not, just to keep doing something. And eventually you're, you're, you're gonna get the muscle memory, your yeah. brain is going to start remembering the pathways that you've been traveling and you get better. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it's, it is, it's a big, it's a big thing. And people ask me all the time, how did I become a professional mosaic artist? And it's because in 1996, I broke some tiles and made a horrible piece of art, but it didn't matter. I never stopped doing it from that day forward. And it right. is the daily practice and Kelly Knickerbocker, if you don't follow her, should follow her. She's one of the best at her studio practice. It is a daily practice. And that is how she's evolved. It's how Rachel's evolved. It's how many of us um, as artists, you know, instructing is important to us because we want to share what we have learned in our daily practice and why it's so important to us. And it's the passion that, that drives us. It's not because we need to do it. It's a passion. Well, maybe it's a need, but it's on a level that's deeper than I think any of us would say financially. It's more of that comes kind mm -hmm. of the bonus after. I, I described it the other day when I was writing as just that the creative process makes me feel alive. Um, mm -hmm. It's when I'm most engaged in my life is when I'm making something, yeah. whether it's, I mean, it could be gardening too, because I mm -hmm. get a lot of you know enjoyment or aliveness out of gardening. So yeah. uh, I, I think that that is what everybody should be doing, more of the things that make them feel alive. Exactly. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So one more question, and I don't, maybe we've already covered it. What environment do you think is necessary to create intuitively? Uh, space, quiet, time, um, you know, having a room of your own, a room of one's own, like Virginia Woolf said, uh, whether it's a real studio or um, just a, a, a space, you know, even a uh, that's kind of sacred, that is your space. I think that's a huge part of it right there. Um, that could even be outside, um, you know, walking out along a river or, but I, I think away from the screens, <clears throat> the screens are very much in our way of tapping into our intuitive nature. I believe they're, they're constantly distracting us. You know, I say this as we are all meeting each other right now through a screen. So I mean, there's no getting around them. They're, they're a part of our lives quite clearly. But I think uh, carving out places where we can be away from them. Uh, and I'm talking to myself on this one too, <laughs> uh, because I, I, I think they keep us from, um, from our intuitive nature, the screens do. So uh, I think that might be the biggest challenge for modern people right now is, is getting away from the screens for short periods of time. Yeah. yeah. Totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. Outside of self, what other aspect contribute to your artwork and to your writing? <clears throat> Outside of self, what other? My family, um, my family history. It's something that I'm finding that I'm writing a, a lot about is, is, is my mother's stories. My mother's a wonderful storyteller. And I grew up on her stories, so they've become a part of my my own memories. Sometimes I feel like I've lived her stories, even though they're they're not mine; they're hers. But I feel like they're they're mine. Uh, so, and things that just happen every day. I don't know. Um, you know, living amidst this <clears throat> this crazy adventure of the ruins gives me a lot of 
feeding my creativity just because there's so many things happening here uh, with other people's creativity, you know, cause I'm, it's right there in front of me. Other people's creativity is present is right in front of me and my job is to help them. So me helping them is actually helping me too. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. All right. We have two more questions as we're wrapping up our hour. Is it better to do art traditional or experimental? Oh, um, well, I, I can't answer that question. I, I mean, I don't think there is a better. I, I think, um, you know, I got myself to Italy for very short spurts of time and that changed the game for me completely. I got, you know, introduced to the traditional tools of the Hammer and Hardy, which, you know, truly changed my life. Uh, so that's always a tradition that I embrace and, and want to be a part of my life. But the, what was the second word experimenting or experimental experimental? I mean, I, I just say, I'm not choosing one. You have to have both because mosaic is always going to be traditional in certain ways with on Demento. You have to no, you don't have to do anything. Take that back. <laughs> you do not have to do anything, but isn't it a wonderful adventure to bring on Demento into your life as a communication tool uh, so in some ways that will always be a traditional set of rules, but um, it's also your choice as an artist because, oh my gosh, I mean, artists are supposed to be experimenters. That's what makes new art. Uh, we should be do experimenting every single day. So, exactly. I mean, I lean more, you know what? I, I don't lean more towards one or the other. I don't, I, I like them both. Well, and I think they're almost like a combination. It's almost like they're just two in the same. And that sort of leads to the last question, which is, do you have to know the rules before you break them? <laughs> well, that's one of my favorite things to say. Who asked that question? Um, J-Mac. Hmm. Uh, I, like, I like to know the rules before I break them. But again, I don't want to tell anyone what to do because some rule breakers there are always exceptions, always exceptions in our wonderful creative world. And there are people who never learn the rules and, and break them without knowing them and are hugely successful or maybe not saying successful, but just create a, um, you know, a, an emotional connection, which is what we're all looking for when we're creating art it was, we want people to feel things. Right. Um, <clears throat> so ask that question one more time, Jimmy. It says, oops, sorry, I lost it. It says, do you have to know the rules before you mm -hmm. break? Yeah, I, well, I'll go back to saying you don't have to do anything. You don't. Right. You can do whatever the hell you want. Because um, no, but there is no, I am not a mosaic police. Um, you know, there might be people that try to be mosaic police, but you don't need to listen to them. But you should, you should absolutely embrace the idea of excellence. And you should, you know, uh, follow the road uh, for technique and, and be the best artist you can be. Absolutely. But um yeah, I, I, I think I've changed a lot on that one because I used to say you have to know the rules in order to break them. Uh, and I, I do enjoy knowing the rules before I break them myself, but I don't want to tell anybody what to do. No. And I think I, my kind of uh, motto has always been know the laws so you can bend the rules. And the laws are more about, you know, your proper substrates and adhesives so that if you are going to take the time, money and energy to make something, you want to do it on something that's going to last depending on its environment. And after that, yeah. I say, go for it. And it just depends what you are learning and what you do want to get better at. And that there is no law on that as an artist uh god i'd hate to have told, been told what to do that wouldn't that wouldn't work out so well right. so on that note we have wrapped up all of our questions what Yay. a very fast and engaging hour oh, this was it's unbelievable mm -hmm. thank you rachel so much for being able to enrich us with everything that you've shared. I think it's phenomenal. And with everything you going, have going on in your life, we are just uh, lucky to have sat here with you for an hour. Yes, it was virtual. If we could have all been together, that would have been fantastic. But this is the best we, could, we can do to infuse this engagement into our community, which we are going to continue to do. And on that note, because you have stuck with us for exactly one hour, we have a little gift for you that goes through tomorrow night. And this is our 15% off all of Rachel's courses. If there's one you don't own, this is your chance to get it. It will only work for Rachel's courses. And you use the code AskRachelAnything. And this will be good through tomorrow night at midnight. 
And if you have any questions or want to know what's the best course for you to take at this time, don't be afraid to shoot an email to myself or Rachel. And you can find those uh, emails at you know, Tammy at mosaicartsonline.com or Rachel's is on her website in her contact section at sagermosaics.com. And um, outside of that, I just want to say thank you, everyone, for being here, for enjoying this time with us. If you're catching this after the event has happened, please enjoy watching it when it works for you. And like I said, this code will work. Ask Rachel uh, until tomorrow night, Sunday, February 12th at midnight, California time. Can I say one more thing, too? Mm -hmm. Just to wrap it up. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, one of the things that uh, has changed a bit with announcements for things that are happening at the ruins or anywhere in, you know, in this little world I live in is that uh, um, the first people to hear of announcements um, are the people who are subscribing to my Substack because it's the most important place for me right now. So I've chosen, uh, I still do Instagram. I, you know, I kind of default to Facebook, <clears throat> um, but as far it, the beautiful thing about Substack that I truly am just I'm having a love affair with it is there's no algorithm. So there's nobody pushing you down or pushing you up for things that, that you haven't, you know, you don't have control over. Um, everybody who's there is there because they want to be there because they've subscribed. And I, you know, I send two emails a week, Wednesday and Saturday, like clockwork. And they're all, you know, always very thoughtful pieces of writing, sometimes a little bit you know, a little bit of poetry or something, almost always mosaic related in some ways. But if you want to look it up, it's the Ruin Substack, S-U-B-S-T-A-C-K. And it's actually a fascinating website besides just the fact that I'm there. There's a lot of writers on there, a lot of wonderful writers. Anything you can think of is on that website. And it's just a very positive, uh, free expression kind of a place. And uh, I love it. So I would love it if you would join me there. I agree. I've watched, uh, I've listened and read a lot of Rachel's Substack. The podcasts are great. So it's just another way to listen and enrich your life with someone that uh, spends a lot of time in her daily practice of some version of Mosaic Art. So thank you everyone for being here and we will announce our next live in the next few weeks, but stay tuned as we have some really, really exciting things coming up for Mosaic Arts Online. So until next time, stay well and thank you for being here. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye.